down a little bit. Yeah, you sit down. <laughs> I'm going to raise my chair up. Yeah. Why don't I sit next to him? <laughs> I'll just scoot it back so I'm just a little further away. <laughs> In my mind, I was going to be this tall when I was young. <laughs> you are that tall. Yes. <laughs> So, so has, uh, everyone has talked about housing as one of the major topics, and if it's not housing, it's traffic. And um, we, I really think that they go hand in hand, but today we're really going to dive into housing and, and the future of our housing in, in Silicon Valley. And so my first question I'd like to um, talk about is with Gary here. Um, what, do you th what do you think the future of the housing market is in Silicon Valley? Well, we're going to have the continued demand for housing, and it really all starts with the jobs that are in this area and the economic engine. And you look at companies like Facebook, Apple, Google, and the amounts of people that they're pulling in in terms of employment. Anytime you have that much drive for employees, you're going to have that much more drive for housing because they need some place to live. So I continue to see the demand for housing to exist far into the future. Great, thank you. And I jumped the gun a little bit. I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Bonacorsi. Diana introduced me. I'm a Fremont Council member. Before that, I went to Santa Clara University as an undergrad and in law school. So I, although Fremont's my home, second, Santa Clara is my second home. I'm proud to be here today. Hi, my name is Gary Nobile, and thank you to Diana Ding for inviting me here. I'm a lifelong Santa Clara and one of the few natives that have been here the whole time. And I am a realtor with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. I've been in the business for over 20 years. Hi, my name is Sherman Chan. I'm a real estate broker for CBRE. I uh, focus on representing tech companies and, and uh, technology owners uh, in their real estate. We talked about uh, a company that I represent in, in uh, Fremont for, for over 20 years that is, is one of uh, David's constituents. And, Thank you, Diana, for inviting me. Thank you. All right. Um, building on Gary's point about the companies and how they, how they influence the housing market in Silicon Valley, I'd like to um, ask Chen here. So we're landlocked in Silicon Valley. And in a, a recent article I read, it showed that companies are leaving San Francisco because of a lack of um, office space. So do you see that in Silicon Valley, especially the South, South County? And um, how do you think we could build on that? How do you think we could keep companies here? So it's a combination of uh, multiple things. Uh, tech companies are stay and come to Silicon Valley because of the talent, right? For the quality of employees and the talent of employees that we have here. Uh, in San Francisco, you see some people leaving from a cost perspective, but a lot of that's not going to be uh, kind of the core headquarter assets, right? It might be back office type. I think that's what you'll see more in the Valley. I think from a, um, so that, that talent and that uh, ability, the, the confluence of there's money here with venture capital, there's education here with uh, all the universities, uh, and that feeds what these tech companies need, right? Uh, the one thing I'll say about housing and that how it affects tech companies is that obviously is really important to them. Um, we have a dire housing crisis in terms of the supply side versus the jobs that we've created. Uh, so if, just for a quick numbers wise, Bay Area wise, um, over the last, since 2010, we have accumulated initial growth of jobs around 740,000 uh, new jobs. And the amount of housing that we've created over that same time is around 140,000, right? So we're, the imbalance that we have, and this is a cumulative effect every year. So it's a hundred, we're five times less in housing that we've provided in jobs. And if you, and that's just permits that have been approved. Um, so that's not going to change anytime soon because we are so far behind, right? And in Santa Clara uh, County specifically, uh, it's, it's 155,000 jobs that we've created since 2010, and we've only created like 30,000 new housing permits. So it's something where we, it's, we're not going to catch up fast and companies are still growing. It's a great point and it's a segue into uh, my question for David is, so with, we're always trying to increase jobs in Silicon Valley and it's, it's really happening naturally with the economy um, continuously growing. So how do, from the city's perspective, how do they deal with the demand for housing and the, the increasing jobs? 
Uh, thank you for the question. The, the problem is, the issue is that the localities, particularly along the peninsula, have not addressed the issue of housing. So in Fremont, we're suffering from it. We have two-thirds of our commuters in Fremont neither live nor work in Fremont. They're cutting through Fremont in order to get to the jobs in Silicon Valley. So what's happening now, because there hasn't been re responsible local leadership, the state is filling the gap, much to my chagrin, because it's taking away local control. But the perfect example is uh, Valco and what's, what's called SB 35. For years, there's been resistance in Cupertino to any kind of mixed-use housing at all. So the state takes a look at that and says, okay, we're gonna swoop in and demand a solution. And SB 35 says if a developer in Sand Hill did this, has a number of affordable housing units that uh, are part of the mix, then it's over the counter. You don't even get a planning commission here, you don't get a city council hearing, and it goes in. And that was the leverage that they had over Cupertino City Council to demand that mixed use housing goes there. So in response to other questions, I'll talk about the homelessness crisis, but the housing demand may increasingly be a state mandated solution, which I think we need to fight back on, but only if we all act regionally in a responsible manner. Thank you for that. And and I think it is really important. I'll jump right into affordable housing right now. Um, so for, for Gary, there's a, a lot of people push for affordable housing, and, and, that's, and, and that's to help, and a lot of people in business to push for affordable housing to, um, so they can have their employees a place to live. And, and so do you think, do you, what is your position on mandated affordable housing, and do you think that it has an impact on the rest of the market? Well, affordable housing we, we refer to as BMR, below market rate. And when a developer is looking at developing a certain segment of land, and let's say they're going to put 500 units in there, they need a certain return on that investment. And you make money in two ways in real estate. One, you make it on cash flow, which is your rental income. The other way is you make it on appreciation. Well, in this area, if you look at the ratio between cash flow, in other words, rent for what somebody pays, versus the value of that land, it's actually a very low percentage. So most of the investors are making their money on appreciation. That's what they're banking on. So if you say, okay, now we're going to take away some of that cash flow, what you are in effect doing in some cases is driving that investor away to another market where they can get the return that they want. So that's the impact. That, that's a great point. And, and back to David here, um, how does the city balance the affordable housing need and then enticing people to develop to close that housing gap? We've done better than most, but each of the cities have what's called a regional housing needs allocation that is set by the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Commission through the state. They're not, they, we are far short of what our goals are. We've done better than most. We're converting a hotel like the Islander to uh, affordable housing. But again, um, What's going to happen is there may be state mandated solutions. Another one that just came down was AB 2923 that may not affect uh, those of us who are in Santa Clara County, but those of us that are near a BART station, the state now says that uh, BART will control the density and mixed use housing right next to the BART stations without local control. So it may solve some of the affordable housing, but at a, you know again in a situation that may increase other stressors on our infrastructure in the cities. So uh, it is a huge challenge. I should mention that before I was on the city council, I was on um, a, a boat services, which is a regional player in affordable housing. And so I had some experience in that regard. We need to look for more public-private partnerships, more investments to change the equation. Once the uh, Trump uh, tax uh, bill got passed, it took away some of the incentives for financing and affordable housing. We need to look at other ways of changing the, uh, the economic uh, configuration to make it uh, affordable. Great, thank you. And a similar question for Chen. Do the companies that you represent, what is, do, do they look for when they're finding a place, how big is the impact, how big is the impact um, on the surrounding housing areas? So do they, do they look at the availability of housing in the areas and um, how big of a role does that play? It's, it's, a, it's a big part of how they evaluate sites because ultimately they go where the employees are if they can. 
uh, the, the employee's ability to get, get to their campus and work and thrive uh, is really important. So now you're seeing uh, with Google in downtown San Jose uh, the importance of being in you know, these mixed-use TOD areas uh, with transit-oriented development uh, being a big push of where they want to go. So we see a premium in rents that, that, that companies will pay to be along that transit corridor. So it's a 30 to 50% increase in rent that they'll pay to be right, to be right there. Um, and I think the, the, the part that David brings up really nicely in terms of needing to make it affordable, with the affordable housing, is that developers, in order for them to pencil, as Gary said, and make money uh, for them to build, is you're gonna have to allow the density to happen. Uh, and right now, a lot of that in, in Cupertino, other areas, they're not letting the density happen, which um, you need in order for it to make, to make it work. Uh, but once you allow parts of that, then, uh, then you'll close that housing gap. Great, thank you. And, and um, one of the things that people don't really think about in Silicon Valley is, is how these major companies can cross over city lines and have a real, a real impact on the, on the housing market. So how, for a question for David here is how do cities prepare for a major transition of, of employees going from one city to another? And is that an issue for cities? It certainly is an issue for cities. Let me give you an example. I don't mean to be blaming uh, other cities, but it is a reality. The new Apple campus in Cupertino created 12,000 jobs in Cupertino. They only approved, to my knowledge, only 27 new units last year. So you talk about ratios. That's 12,000 jobs. Where are these people going to live? They're living in Livermore. They're living in the Central Valley. Again, they're coming through Fremont, and we suffer from it. One of the things in Fremont we've done is we are been fortunate is that we've had about a one to one housing ratio. The jobs to housing imbalance needs to focus on having jobs closer to housing that reduces traffic, that gets people out, off our freeways, off our arterials. And uh, we just got lucky in Fremont uh, with the Ardenwood uh, Business Park. Um, uh, sure, sure, Facebook, exactly. Facebook and Tesla have moved over from the peninsula to Fremont. And fortunately, we could have had a real surge in traffic, but fortunately, many of the employees that are working there already live in Southern Alameda County. So we got lucky. Uh, but that wasn't because of great foresight or planning, but we need to be taking more of a regional approach. Part of it's luck, but part of it is companies, like you were saying, realizing that where their workforce is. And uh, you know, Facebook and other companies have been reticent to, to move to other locations. They like to keep campuses together. Um, but once they looked at in Ardenwood, and Ardenwood has been, you know, languishing for 20 years, right? Uh, they really they they did polls with their employees, and so many wanted to work in in that east side, East Bay side, not have to cross the but Dunbarton Bridge, and have affordable housing nearby, uh, and allowing that to happen in all these regional areas, because we have to think regionally in order to solve it, uh, and that's that's been the biggest issue that uh, isn't just a Santa Clara County issue or other counties there, it's a whole Bay Area issue. That's a, that's a good point, and, and I really want to um, ask Gary about this. So people want to live closer to their, to their work, and the companies want people to work closer to their work. So um, a, an example is Google moving, from, moving to San Jose, and you see a, a lot of, there's going to be a, a higher demand in housing in, in near Google campus. So from your perspective, how do you think that impacts the micro market just surrounding that area? Well, several things happened as soon as Google made that announcement. One, prices of property right around that area pretty much spiked. And second thing you saw was big companies like Trammell Crow, who helps Google acquire commercial property, was strategically buying several pieces of, of land out there, which they're continuing to buy for that expansion. So when you see that kind of demand, and if you you know have a history of this area and saw what happened to Mountain View when Google went there, everybody thought, well, gee, that should be nice. But then what happened was everybody who tried to buy there got priced out pretty quickly because Google pays their their employees pretty darn well. So does Apple, so does Facebook. The next thing you know, people couldn't afford to live there. So I think in anticipation of Google coming to downtown San Jose, people had that same foresight and were out there buying property in full force, which spiked the prices. 
That's great. And um, one more follow-up question for you is, is do you, in, in Silicon Valley, do you think, do you think the looking at companies moving, is that, is that a great indicator of the housing market? And, and what else do you think is also an indicator of the housing market for this area specifically? Well, companies moving, that's a couple different issues there. So I'll just give you an example. So Apple bought some property over in North San Jose, and North San Jose has not been the most highly desirable area out of all of Santa Clara County. Not the worst, but has not been highly desirable. But Apple, recognizing that there's not many more places to build, they've already bought some sizable chunks of land over there in anticipation of their next complex. So that may be the next frontier from an investment standpoint. But what was the second part of your question, sorry? What else, what is another indicator for, for looking at the housing market in Silicon Valley? It, certainly the jobs again, it kind of goes in this order. I look at, world according to Gary, it may not be the right way, but. <laughs> so I look at first, that's, right. that's a website already, yeah. <laughs> so I first look at what's the local economy doing? What's the job growth there? Then I look at national, then I look at global because believe it or not, uh, you all know this, we're, we're highly impacted by other parts of the globe. And so you see people from China, people from India coming here because of the economic activity that drives housing prices. Also, interest rates, when it becomes, when interest rates start to go up as they are now, it becomes a little more expensive. So that puts a little bit of a constraint. And other things that are going on are, you know, government and regulatory things like you can't deduct a certain amount of uh, interest on your tax returns over a certain dollar amount. And that puts some, some constraints on there. So all those things together, what do I look at? On a weekly basis, I look at what's available for sale, how many units are there versus how many that are selling. And use that as a guide, look at a trend, compare it to a year ago and the year before that so you can get some seasonality effects. Thank you, thank you. Um, back to David here, you talked about local control a little bit and, and I know each city doesn't, doesn't live in a silo and one city can impact another city. Um, so looking at Proposition 10, um, can I get your input on that as a, as a local politician and, and responsible for one city. Um, just get your input, input on that. Okay, I assume most of you are, know what Proposition 10 is, but I'll describe what Proposition 10 intends to do and, and because of the ads, what it's not doing. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a uh, legislation that passed in the mid-90s that called, was called Costa-Hawkins, is called Costa-Hawkins, and what Costa-Hawkins does is it prohibits cities from imposing rent control on apartments that are, or units that are built after February of 1995. You can have rent control for older units before 1995, and that may have made sense in 1995, but it's now 2018. So what Proposition 10 will do, if it passes, is it will not make that distinction between units before or after 1995 that a city, if it wishes to, can impose rent control on all its product types. Um, and so there's, but it doesn't by itself mandate um, uh, that affordable uh, rent control go us in. It goes back to local control. So I've come down and I've been asked in various forums, what's your position, because uh, I'm also a candidate for office right now. I have a consistent one. I am for Proposition 10 because I believe in local control, but in the city of Fremont, we've already exercised that local control by having a rent review ordinance, which is now non-binding, uh, and it's encouraging uh, tenants who have more than 5% increase in a calendar year to go through a rent review board after a facilitation doesn't work, if it doesn't work. We've only had 40 cases so far, all but one uh, were resolved through mediation. So we're going to hope, as I called it at the time, it's rent review on ster steroids. So uh, it's muscular, it's attacking the problem, and we're doing it without imposing rent control. So I can be both for Proposition 10, which is a, a, a position that I'm sure my, my colleagues here oppose, but at the same time, don't mandate rent control and have local solutions to address the needs in each city. Thank you, thank you for that. That's a great explanation. And I'm gonna switch over a little bit to the development side of it. Now, developing is, is a lot of people see it as a, as a bad word, right? And, and um, it has a, a negative connotation to it. But people also say that we have a housing shortage. And so it's a little bit of conflicting interest there. So why do you think development 
I'll, I'll, I'll ask Chen here, why do you think development has, has had this negative connotation and how do you think developers can, go to, can fix this? Well, I think the fallacy is that uh, developers build these projects that they get leased up really quickly and they make a ton of money and they're making a ton of money on people. Uh, and the reality is that it, it all comes back to uh, economics and pricing, right? And so what people don't realize is that the cost for these developers to build has gone up significantly, um, both from a standpoint of hard construction costs, um, labor costs in terms of get people to build, right? So hard construction costs have gone up 68% since 2010. Right, so that's a cost that, that a developer has to bear in order to, to, to make a project work. Then you add fees into it uh, that come from city and affordable housing limits. Uh, and then now you'll see interest rates increasing. So it's easy to say that, hey, you develop and, and, and you make money. But the, the, like we said, the margins, they're not, they're not making anything. They're hopefully making an appreciation. Um, and developers are there to satisfy need. Right? And the need is, is, is very apparent. Um, and they're willing to work with, and, and tech companies too, are willing to work with cities to do that. But um, it, it has to be, like we talked about, a partnership, right, and public-private partnership. And I'll say that certain cities have done really well in that. And if you think about Santa Clara specifically, and you think about what hap what changed in Santa Clara Square, just two blocks from here, right, where there used to be old applied materials, single-story buildings, knocked them all down, and now you have this great mixed-use development, right? You've got a million square feet that is all leased up, uh, by Irvine Company, you have residential there, you have a great little retail center, and that keeps people here. Uh, and that's the type of uh, uh, development that everyone benefits in. Um, and you brought up the uh, Cupertino and Valco, right? That's a great opportunity for Cupertino and that hasn't been taken advantage of. And so that's what, that's what needs to happen. That's two just five miles apart and the difference between the two is, is significant. And from a development standpoint, they're ready to go do these mixed use developments. Um, but they get a lot of limitations, which basically, if they give them limitations, it limits their uh, pricing and they can't afford to build that. Great, thank you. And now, I'll, same question for Gary. Um, what do you, why do you think the developers, or development has developed this bad, uh, negative connotation and what can developers do to fix this? Well, why have they, the first part of the question, I'll just give you some perspective of what some of my clients have told me who live in the area. Some of them have been here a long time, and they say, gee, you know, we have all this traffic, so therefore I don't like that. The, the second thing that I'm hearing is that cities are approving, and, and I don't know how valid this is, to be honest, but cities are approving major complexes where each unit only has one parking space, which everybody knows everybody has more than one car, which causes overflow into the neighborhoods of the people who have been here for a while. So those are a couple of factors, plus there's a concern about because of all the droughts, where's all the extra water coming from. So there's a lot of reasons why they're, they're getting a bad rap, including what, what Sherman had indicated a minute ago about the perception that they're just making a bunch of money off of a residence and going away. That's really not the case, I don't think. We need them and they need us. So what, you know, what are some of those solutions? How can you make some of those things go away? Well, that's not an easy question to answer. I don't think anybody has one answer for that. Uh, one potential solution is to offer a little bit of a rebate, perhaps, for the developers to allow for some more parking, something none of the cities seem to be um, terribly motivated to want to do. Um, there could also be some incentives regarding uh, financing, which they could provide to some of the developers, which uh, would allow them to not have to make the rates as high as they need to be in order to get the returns. That, again, if they don't get the return, they're not going to build here. Those are a couple of ideas. Um, on a larger standpoint, with respect to transportation and the traffic, um, something that I haven't seen anybody approach, but I would love to see is your big companies, you know, your Facebooks again, your Apples, your Googles, have some sort of a consortium or, or some sort of a subsidiary where they work together to try to develop a solution to some of the traffic concerns, because it's not an easy one, and it's going to be very expensive. But we've got some of the brightest and the best right here. I'd love to see them participate collectively. Great, thank you. That's, uh, that's great, um, great input there. And now, same question here from a different perspective. Um, what does the city look for in a development and how do they, um, how do, what, what do they look for when developers are going for a project? Okay, and, and it ties, dovetails with the, que the questions you asked the other panelists. 
Very few people understand the development process for cities. People are frustrated with development because they just assume that the developers coming in, like you said, trying to make a lot of money, leave the city and they're, they're lining the pockets of council members who are rolling over. Nobody understands that we're governed by general plans. And general plans have a housing element that's dictated by the state, has a circulation element which is dictated by state law. These are requirements and we have things called uh, sustainable community strategies and things that have been state legislation where we're trying to mandate uh, more rooftops closer to transit. So when we approve a project, we are in a situation where staff is recommending a project. I've never approved a project to my knowledge that had staff re recommending that we don't approve it. The reason staff recommends it is because it's following our general plan and our zoning. Most of our long-term residents don't understand it. They, they bought a house in the 50s, 60s, 70s, single family, you know, small footprint. They don't want this growth and they're angry. But to your point, there are solutions, at least in Fremont, because we can deal with the cut through traffic by getting them on the freeways. And if, if you reduce the traffic in the city, uh, then the stressors of increased development within the city limits will be less. But unfortunately, we have a large group of people that are appealing to people's ignorance, but that people are running for office and saying, all that traffic's caused by that little infill project on Mission Boulevard. It's not true. You're laughing because you know it's not true. But people believe that. And they say, okay, well, I'm going to vote Bonacorsi yeah, out. We're going to vote these other people out because they approved that project and they're causing all these cars to come here. If we turn down every project we had approved for the last four or five years that are already online, we'd still have the same problem. But that's not a truth, not a fact-based argument that people that are running as on the NIMBY slate would ever want the people to understand. So we have an enormous obligation to educate, to inform, to balance housing and jobs, but it really requires a lot of effort. So that's why development has a negative connotation. People don't understand it, and it's demagogued to death. That's great, uh, that's great. And, and I have a follow-up question for you because you, you brought up the general plan. Yeah. And, it, and it seems like people, um, they, they, they present their side and, and give their input after, after a developer has put in millions and millions of dollars into a project. Um, and they're following the general plan, but people don't want to give their input into the actual general plan. So, so for the people, for people that said that not in my backyard people that um, oppose certain development projects, how, what, what would be your input for them so where they could actually have an, they could have a major impact in actually develop or planning the city? Well, if I could turn back the clock, we had, uh, updated our general plan in 2012 or, you know, or 2011. It's called General Plan 2030. It was a five-year ramp up, but it coincided with the Great Recession. So people weren't feeling the, the, the effects of traffic or the effects of housing because it was very slow. We had a number of outreach uh, uh, forums to the community, but very little participation. We should have done a better job educating the public in anticipation for the growth, and then we've had sustained economic uh, growth for a record period of eight years now, which has never historically never happened before. Um, I do believe, that's why I also believe in local control, because if we get more SB35s and AB2923s where the state's mandating over-the-counter uh, approvals, there's going to be a further disconnect between the public and their local officials. They're going to think that we're responsible for things that we cannot control. And they're going to say, well, we'll put people in there that can control it, even if they can't. Mm -hmm. So we do need to find ways that we can maintain local control, have demand high levels of architectural control so that it fits. We have a community character element in our general plan, which is not required in all general plans, that is sensitive to the surrounding neighborhoods. But we need to fight for that local control so we can balance the needs for housing in a way that is not so jarring to the public, uh, to bring the public along as we transition uh, and address the population needs. Thank you, that's, that's great. And uh, now for Chen here. Um, Sherman. Sherman. Chen, oh, Sherman, I'm sorry, Sherman. Yeah, yeah. Um, so traffic obviously plays a huge, a huge role and, and a lot of companies are going to split shifts and, and things like that. How, how do you think, um, the, com the company picking their place to go and, and being smart about which, which location they choose, how do you think that can play a role in, uh, in the traffic problem? And then are is that something that companies really think about? 
Yeah, I mean, traffic and, and getting employees to their campus is, is you know, huge. Um, and the way that companies are trying to deal with a lot of that is, is, is basically, um, you know, be in locations where you have a, a more urban type of environment. Um, you know, when we grew up in the valley, uh, everyone drove to these uh, suburban business parks, right? You just drove everywhere. And now, in all those neighborhoods, uh, everyone's trying to make those more um, mixed-use developments, right? And, and, and demand that uh, there's housing that's walking distance, there's amenities that are walking distance, so that people stay in those locations, right? Versus driving through Fremont. Um, and so, and talk about a general plan uh, that, needs, uh, that needs revising so that it allows for that mixed-use development to occur in all these different little uh, sub-markets, which is the example of Santa Clara Square, mm -hmm. right? And so the companies, there are other uh, new projects that companies could have gone to, and the first ones they leased are the ones of Santa Clara Square, and it's because of that mix. Um, and we talk about general plan issues and things like that. If you look at San Francisco, I mean, 70% of the zoning there is for single-family homes, right? And it's like, that doesn't make sense. And so um, that forward thinking is what, what you need, and, and Fremont's been uh, really good at that, and especially with, with, with BART being there too. And so when I think of it, I think of Fremont, I think of Santa Clara as being uh, two cities that kind of get that. San Jose's trying because of it being so big, and North San Jose and, and all the residential there, but um, that's, that's starting to happen as well. Thank you, thank you. And and uh, before we open up for questions, because we're running out of time, is there anything that you feel is, is that people really need to know about the housing market and the development um, for the future of Silicon Valley? So if, if anybody has any, any uh, things that it's really you think that it's one last thing that they need to know. Well, I, I wanted to talk about some aspect, which is if we deal with the infrastructure and transportation problems, then we can absorb the housing problems better. And we're developing a last mile traveled in, Santa, in Fremont, and I'm sure other cities are. We have the new Warm Springs BART station. We have the Fremont BART station. We may have an Irvington BART station. We're also developing a pedestrian bridge over 880. So those things will, we need to encourage people getting out of their cars. And again, if we reduce the stressors of traffic and have people working closer to where they uh, live, that's how we can absorb the, the growth that we need in this, in this area. Thank you, thank you. Gary? Um, just maybe a quick snapshot of where we're at right now because we haven't talked about today and from what I'm seeing the last five six months prices have actually of residential housing have actually come down and I'm seeing that because prices have been so high for so long and there's been so much appreciation that there's a certain point where the market won't tolerate that and we're starting to see that as well as interest rates going up and in this area one of the things that causes people to to be able to buy real estate in terms of their down payment and i see this a lot when i'm evaluating both from a buying a buyer or a seller that i'm working with evaluating an offer is where is the source of their income what is the source of their assets and a sizable portion of the assets of the people that are buying real estate here is coming from stock options and the stock market. Mm -hmm. So we have this underlying effect that nobody really talks about until we see a little bit of a reversal, which, by the way, we've seen this week, and China's been seeing it for a while. And so when you see these downturns in the stock market, then all of a sudden people... I think this just... Um, we go. Then, then you start... To <laughs> Time's up. I think you got the message. <laughs> <laughs> you can cut it off. Um, I guess my message is, is I think generationally, right? So I've got kids. How are they going to afford to live here? Right? They're not going to be able to afford to live here. I don't want them living in my house forever, right? So um, I think of, of, of uh, supporting correct development and not being afraid of that, right? Because that imbalance is not going away. Um, I'll say that. Uh, I'll say no on 10. <laughs> from the perspective of it doesn't help, um, it just makes things more expensive, right? Because people can't now build uh, to the quality of, the, of those developments are gonna go down as uh, people can't invest into their buildings and say, I can get the rent to go do that. Um, so, the basics. Thank you, thank you. And we have a, a time for a couple questions here. Does anybody have questions? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I wanted to be on the panel. I have about 43 questions. Uh, but I, I, will, I will refrain because they will cut off my mic. 
But, but Gary, you were talking about incentives for developers, and everybody's talking about below market rate or affordable housing. And I grew up in the Bronx, which is a different world altogether. So when you talk density, I laugh. But um, we had, I lived in a, a high rise apartment building, and my folks, uh, we had a basement apartment because we were not rich. And the doctor had the corner apartment, which was about four times the size of ours and beautiful windows, which we didn't have, you know, because they were rich. And what happened is there was, there were different size houses, different size apartments actually. And the thing that bugs me is we are constantly talking affordable housing rather than what I think of as housing that's affordable, which is different sizes in the same location, which would be, give the profit margin to the developer. And, uh, and, and, the, and the more housing we have, obviously the prices are gonna come down. And oh, by the way, I live in Santa Clara, and I am so glad the Apple campus raised my uh, real estate value <laughs> tremendously. But I think we, we need to start talking about building more smaller units, housing that's affordable within the same complexes so that we're not discriminating. That'll sell, right? Sure. That'll sell. I didn't get a question in there. Was there a question yeah, no, in there? No, it was a comment. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> Can I assume I can ask the next one? Um, thank you all. This is eye-opening. I was one of those ignorant, ignorant voters who have been voting the wrong thing. So now I know. Um, my question actually um, has already been touched by David. It's about transportation and infrastructure. We take a pride in having so many wonderful, glory companies located in Silicon Valley. And with the current administration, the tax rates are actually being cut. So that really doesn't help us to have more revenue in our general funding or special funding, which actually increase the conflict or burden on the city, on the county. So my question here is, is it possible, or maybe it's already happening, just I don't know. All the cities and counties should team together and talk to those rich companies and ask them to help with the communities that they have been taking advantage and feel the entitlement of using the infrastructure facilities that were built many years ago. Do not approve the permits so easily. Ask them to build a road, contribute, not just through the tax rate, because they are not paying enough taxes to support us, but is there something that you guys can team up and come up with a solution consistently and uniformly so that we don't just take pride in technology, we also take pride in having them in the community and build this community a better place for everyone, not just for the rich, but for everyone. Thank you. I don't. Hey, go ahead. <laughs> well, I think that, that if you think of those companies, right, and, and those tech companies, I mean, the mission of those companies, uh, if you think of, uh, of their leaders, right, their, their, their mission isn't, hey, we're going to make money and, and run away, right? They're trying to, trying to change and improve the world. Um, and, th and they believe that, right? So I think that public-private partnership is something that they are very keen on. I think the... The, the attitude in terms of thinking that they aren't or they're just trying to make money is something that impairs their ability to kind of cross the aisle and say, let's figure out some solutions together. Uh, Google's gonna do that in San Jose as well. In, in Mountain View and Shoreline, they're trying to do that, right? So what's hard is that um, cities move slowly, uh, everybody has two, four year terms, and then things change. Right? And for, for companies to plan ahead as they grow quickly, um, that consistency of, of what agreement they make within the city can, needs to stay. And what happens is it, it changes a lot, right? Because a development project will take multiple years, and all of a sudden you get within a city council uh, composition that's changed. Then all of a sudden you have, hey, let's go ask for more. Um, so I think that, that part of it is really uh, important in order to, to have these companies that feel comfortable that we can work together on that. And I think they will. I don't, I don't doubt that actually at all. Right? But the game, the, a lot of times the game shifts in the process. Thank you for teeing it up. It gave me some time to think about that very difficult question. 
Uh, one of the things that happened in June is RM3 passed, which provides some regional money for infrastructure. For Fremont, what that means is that we're going to have a, a freeway connection between 880 and 680, which is going to relieve a lot of, of the traffic congestion that we're seeing in town. It's going to be five to seven years. But to your larger point about public-private partnership, again, I'm, thank you for inviting me because Fremont really is part of the Silicon Valley uh, ecosystem. It really is. And, and as much as I'm happy that Google gave $20 million to San Jose to deal with homelessness, we want a little bit of that pie too. So that it really needs the companies, even if they're situated in a particular city, we would want to encourage them to think regionally as well. Um, and uh, again, maybe the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. This is a real tension because you hear local control. Everybody wants to run for council for two, four year terms. They want to stand up and say, this is what I want. One way maybe with development agreements, you can lock in certain entitlements and certain benefits that's, that's recorded against the property that can't be changed by future councils. But again, we need to have a regional approach um, and, and regional leadership. Again, I, I want to commend Libby Schaff in Oakland that did call out Cupertino for what they did in terms of the 12,000 jobs and 27 units in Cupertino. Shame is, is a motivator, but then we need to have structures in place that do think in regional terms. I have a friend that's running for a BART board, and I think she's going to provide some regional leadership from Fremont. They need to be a player as well. So it's multimodal, multi-jurisdictional, uh, and, uh, and public-private partnerships working together. Yeah, last question here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Robert uh, Walsh, and hopefully I can do this quickly before everyone falls into a food coma. <laughs> um, you know, I really appreciate that you guys are letting us grill you here, and I wanted to ask a question about local control. I think that's a really good idea um, in terms of allowing the city to address their own problems. Um, however, I've noticed that some people have commutes that go to other cities, like... Um, San Francisco or outside of Fremont, you're going to be going to Redwood City or some of these other places. If you're giving local control, how do you, um, or how, what are your plans for managing the um, connection between all the different cities as the people move back and forth between their jobs so that you kind of have a consistent overall you know, legislation for all these different places because with local control, you can have local rules, which makes it a little more difficult for investors to try to figure out or navigate these new rule sets. So hopefully that was a clear question, but, you know, please take it away. Again, there was, you, you should review the legislation that was passed in 2017 by the state, which is taking away a lot of the local control in terms of approvals. You can no longer have subjective standards for designs because subjective standards were used by cities as a way of saying, well, we don't think it looks pretty enough. Right. You need to have objective measures. So the state's increasingly occupying the field. One thing that I would propose, and this was not my idea, it was from a former Sunnyvale City Council member. I don't know if he wants to be publicly attached to the idea, but that I would support. In Fremont, we already have a one-to-one -one housing to jobs ratio. I would support le legislation that would mandate that for every other city in the Bay Area so that Cupertino would have to create 12,000 new housing units in Cupertino to accommodate the 12,000 new jobs. I won't get elected anywhere in Cupertino soon. I get that. I'm not running for Cupertino City Council. But that's how you deal with some uniform expectations and start moving, uh, you know, my, my joke to the NIMBYs in Fremont, I said, if you're against uh, housing in Fremont, go to Cupertino and tell them to build more housing. <laughs> so go over there, be pro-growth at Cupertino. But that would be one way of doing it. Maybe simplistic, but it's worth exploring. Montessorino would hate you. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no other, <laughs> exactly. Um, if there's no other questions, I think we could wrap it up here. Any other questions? <laughs>